welcome to Colorado Hunting Hub. This podcast is designed to talk about everything hunting in Colorado. Whether you're a new hunter, old timer, or something else, Colorado Hunting Hub will have something for you. I'm your host, Clint Whitley, and let's get started. Welcome back to Colorado Hunting Hub, and this week's episode, we are talking shed hunting. Uh, and if you're in Colorado, you're excited for Friday, which is May 1st, because we have a season here. And many people think it's ridiculous. I guess it's not something I'm a fan of, but it's the way it is, so I'm going to follow it. Uh, and I'm going to treat it like any other opener, where now I'm pretty excited. Um, the bummer is, is that we've missed some of the nice weather and where I'm headed, it's going to be hot. We're suddenly having a heat wave come in and we'll be mid eighties, high eighties and walking through the desert. That means snakes will be out. Uh, it'll be hot. We can't bring our dogs, uh, because they just won't be able to handle it. And, uh, I don't want to risk uh, mine getting into a rattlesnake because he's never met one. Uh, but usually shed hunting's a great time of the year to get up and get some miles in. Uh, I'm usually in shape twice a year, just about this time and during hunting season and during wrestling season as well when I coach. So those are my two peaks in my in shapeness. And so this really spreads that out and helps, helps me stay somewhat physically, uh, in shape, uh, I, I, I should work out more, but it's, it's a little difficult sometimes. And I like doing things like, uh, run a pod- podcast. Uh, so I guess the other reasons why I like to shed hunt is it's kind of a thrill. There's definitely a thrill of finding a shed, even a little two point little spike. Uh, I still got on my shelf here, a little four inch spike that my wife found. And, uh, we joke that she's a better shed hunter because, she found a four inch spike. It's not an easy thing to do. It looks like a stick. So that's still fun. That versus a, a big mealy or a big elk. Uh, it's just, you never know what you're going to come across. You pull them out of the dirt, out of the snow, and they may have all kinds of extra junk on them, some fun things. So there's, that's the thrill. And you never know how old they are. Some of them look white. Some of them are a little brown and fresh. Uh, it's just fun to look at and see and, and wonder what the life of that animal is and if it's still alive or, uh, it, am I going to find if it was a white shed, am I going to find next year's here too? Just all kinds of questions and things make you wonder. Uh, but the other reason I really enjoy shed hunting is that it helps me find new country and get out and explore. Cause I don't get, even though I live in the mountains, it's, tough for me to get out and do some real serious scouting. I tend to scout more in the season and I realize that's probably not the best, but I, I try and get as much time in the field as I can while I'm in the season. And I have to sacrifice some of the scouting to do that. So, uh, another reason why I go shed on is if I, I don't feel bad conservation wise, because, uh, if, if I don't pick them up, they're just going to go to waste. If in our area, not many small game animals are using them, munching on them. You'll find the occasional one that's been chewed out by a porcupine or maybe a squirrel, but you don't find them like you do in uh, the Midwest where if you don't catch them in that first week, they're all chewed up. We just don't have that, that number of, of critters chewing on them where I shed hunt anyway. Uh, so even the white ones I find are mostly uh, pretty whole. Uh, but last reason I, I enjoy shed hunting is it's, it's some good time to myself. Uh, you get a lot of walking and thinking and, uh, just enjoying the, the green lush new spring growth. But I guess, uh, it's another question people have asked is like, what do you do with them after you pick them up? And Pretty soon here, I'm not gonna sure. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with them because I've got above my fridge is where most of my elk sheds are, a little platform thing. I guess that's not most of my sheds, uh, but some of the some of the nicer ones they're up there above all the cabinets. I've got sheds up there, and then above my another bookcase in the entryway, I got a bunch there, and then everything I've found since uh, my son was born almost two years ago. Uh, in four days, it'll be two years ago. 
Uh, he's got a little shelf in his room. That's the width of his room, and we just stack them up on there. So hopefully, you have to we'll find a new place or. And then any of the chalky ones, they go out in my shed and just get in a big pile there. And I'm that shed hunter that picks up every single shed I find, even if all it is is a four inch piece of chalk that's left. Uh, call me weird, but I'll pick them all up and they all add up into a pile and maybe four bucks a pound later. And I got uh, 30, 40 pounds of chalky stuff and we'll be worth it then. So I know Colorado has started a season just in the last couple of years. Uh, and a big question I have is, does a season help? And hopefully we can get on a division wildlife manager and get him some of these questions to find out. Uh, I will find out in future episodes. Uh, and I struggle with it a little bit because I did miss the nice part of the spring. And we are starting to get some of the grass growing up, makes it hard to find them. And that sort of thing. You don't get that fresh right off the, as the snow melts, the grass is all laid down. That's when it gets a lot easier. Finding these things is hard enough as it is. Uh, you can walk right, right by these brown ones over and over and over again. Uh, and it, it's not an easy thing necessarily. So I need all the help I can get. But we'll find out with uh, our guest in the coming episodes. One of the benefits, though, that we do have a season is that I know they're all dropped. I always like to, I used to before the season, I'd like to go out about St. Patrick's Day. And that was a little early for a lot of elk, still some deer holding on. But that was kind of that time. I was like, well, I'll get started and check some spots and hopefully find some big ones hanging out in some of these areas that had dropped. Uh, and that was just like the most beautiful time. So you'd have really nice March days on the western slope of Colorado. Then you'd get uh, a little snowstorm to give it a break. And you come back to it early April and kind of spread it out through April. And it was great. Now I got May where I just got to hit it hard as much as I can. And actually, I won't go as much. So the season kind of took a weekender, recreator activity and, and really put a, a dampener on that. So uh, I realized one of the reasons was to kind of put a hold on some of the uh commercial purposes so that's fine uh we'll um just deal with it some of the preparation that i am gonna go through and uh, uh prep for pack and all that is uh as follows uh, and the first thing i'm gonna do is create a hunting pack list never I've, I've already done that but I would highly suggest you start your own pack list. Even though you've been hunting for a lifetime, it's nice to have that pack list. And then when you pick up new little ideas from a podcast or a magazine or whatever, you go and record that and not just work off of somebody's Googled pack list because that works for them. If you start throwing in every little thing that everybody tells you, you're packing away 50 pounds and it's just not not going to work. So you got to create your own and what works for you, what works for your region and your area of the state. So first thing I'm going to do is a little pre-trip regimen. So I got some back issues and uh, I'm going to start I'm probably a week late, but I'm going to start popping my glucosamine tablets. Those help quite a bit. So if you have some joint pain, and you're not in the best of shape, we'll throw some of those in and that's going to help some of those aches and pains. Starting some stretching. Uh, if I were a more physical specimen and getting some good workouts in, I wouldn't probably have to do this. But uh, this is my out of shape pre-trip help advice. So uh, do some stretching and get those things kind of taken care of because the last thing you want to do is hobbling along and get some those aches and pains in your knees and back so try and prevent some of that with a little bit of uh, preventative work ahead of time and then some of my gear preparation getting the four-wheeler already i've been that thing's up and running and ready to go for the year been doing that driving that thing every other day uh, but i'll pack some extra fuel some bungees on that thing to strap down some antlers uh, in my four wheeler, I'm going to have a variety of things that'll stay with the four wheeler because uh, just how I shed hunt. I'll keep uh, my tripod in there so that when I'm glassing, I can set that up. 
Uh, I'll keep the jet boil in there with some coffee. There's nothing like turning on a jet boil and getting some some coffee or a hot meal or whatever in the middle of the day. Uh, some mountain house will be in there. Extra water for sure for this trip because uh, it's going to be so hot. My maps will all be in there. Get the camper loaded up with some beer and some good food. And in my pack, uh, I used to use a hand-me-down old Gregory pack that was big internal frame, worked fine, was not a hunting pack, uh, but had something to grab onto antlers on the outside. And I've packed out plenty of animals with it too, but I just upgraded to an Exo Mountain Gear uh, K3 4800. And I love it to death. That thing's awesome. Uh, but in that pack, I'll fill the bladder, uh, but also have another bottle just in case uh, because if that bladder ever bursts, I'm out of water. But also, I use, like to use a little bottle for mixing up some wilderness athlete and some other drink mixes and stuff. So I know I'm name dropping some companies here. They're not giving me a dime. They're not giving me any gear, nothing. But uh, I just wanted to share what I use. And it's not necessary. There's other brands and things that have worked. Up until last year, I used a $10 pack I got from somebody. So uh, you don't have to go out and get a bunch of stuff. It's just four pounds versus an eight ounce pack, eight pound pack. So that's that's the one thing I'm really liking is how light that thing is and comfortable. So I got my water in my pack, uh, my binoculars with a good harness. I got the Alaskan guide that I throw my binoculars in. Uh, I have two nice sets of binos, one Mavens, one Vortex razors. Uh, both are great. Probably not the best shed hunting binos. I probably should have something a little, uh, less high powered. I got 10 by 52s in the vortex and then the mavens are a little goofier. I can't remember the, but they're about this exact same, uh, magnification. So, uh, that's a little much for, for covering ground shed hunting. It's nice to have something to see a wider field of view with your binos. So I don't think you got to have something crazy. Uh, going to have some food. I'll go through my food list. My GPS, uh, I've got an inReach specifically for just texting my wife and making sure she can reach me at all times. Uh, having that option is a lifesaver uh, when you got a little kid at home. That just really gives a peace of mind. A lot of people like to disconnect from the their existing world and want to get away. And I do too. I enjoy that. But when I don't have that communication, it's just, it's a little unsettling. Uh, and I, and I just need to have that communication with my wife, just in case it puts me, gives me some peace of mind, gives her some peace of mind. I don't want her to have to, uh, call somebody, uh, that a friend or something to go if something hits a fan. So I want to be able to, um, make that call myself or support her in some way. Cause, uh, she'd be pissed and may not be so excited about me being out of cell service. So, uh, next thing in, in your phone since, or in your, in your pack is the, uh, my phone. And I've been using Onyx on my phone way more than my GPS. Uh, so I'll download all the maps ahead of time from my area. And then because I'm using my phone, I will use the battery like crazy. So I'll bring multiple phone chargers, portable phone chargers, uh, one actually I could plug into my, that's what I need to do. I bring my cable. Uh, I've got a little cigarette outlet. I can plug into the four wheeler. I'll bring my little portable ones. Just make sure that thing's good and charged up for shed hunting. Chapstick is a winner. Uh, bring some chapstick because I always get dried, dried out, especially in the sun. That's no fun to have uh, chap lips. Uh, I like wilderness athletes. Mountain ops is fine. Whatever, whatever. I just really enjoy the, uh, the hydrate and recover that they, they have. Um, it's just a refreshing drink to have something besides water, little energy boost of some sort. So I suggest whatever your energy boost, little, little thing is have something cause it's refreshing and gives you a little motivation. Been trying out those little mini green things that you pop in your mouth. They're fine. I don't, I don't know if they got any crazy, uh, huge effect, but I've been trying them. Sunglasses. I, I'm not a sunglass guy, but on those really bright days, I hate squinting all day long. So you need to have some sunglasses. I feel like I can't find sheds as well as sunglasses, but that's not proven. That's just my thought. 
Uh, I'd br- like to bring a sidearm just because. It's like a little... Uh, what do I have? A little nine millimeter. My gosh. Don't even know what my own gun is right now. Oh, well. Uh, but a saw of some sort. So I was pheasant hunting in South Dakota once and ran across a dead deer and nice five point five by five white tail. And he, uh, I couldn't get his antlers off. So, uh, I actually ended up using my shotgun to chew the spine to get the skull off. And I just, ever since then, I was like, this is stupid. How am I going to, if I find a dead head, that's actually kind of fresh, I got to have a way to get it off. So there's a couple options. Use those little T handled saws that you use for cutting pelvic bones, uh, your Gerber. I got a Gerber, but the, that thing's heavy. Uh, or you take one of those little like hand saw things that don't weigh anything at all. Uh, that you just grab both ends and work it back and forth. That's a good little survival kit thing to have. Uh, I'll have a knife in my pack just because can't go anywhere without a knife. Uh, electrical tape is a new thing that I saw that I think I'll bring along just as a hopeful tool that I'll need. Uh, or I've seen zip ties. Uh, so if you got a whole lot of antlers on your back after you get a stack of them, it can be kind of hard to, to get more on or be efficient or they're poking you in the legs of the back or whatever. So, uh, having something to strap those on and hold them tight is kind of nice. Flashlight's a huge safety thing. Make sure you're having that. If it's a headlamp, buttons always seem to be turned on. So, uh, I got backup batteries or I have two flashlights or whatever it is. If I have headlamps, I got two of them, um, and extra batteries. Radios are kind of nice for shed hunting season. Trekking poles are going to be a new thing to my pack. And I thought since uh, I got some back issues, it'd be kind of nice. I don't have to carry a gun so uh, other than my sidearm, so I might as well have uh, uh, some trekking poles just to help me go further and then maybe kick some bushes, make sure I'm watching out for snakes. Uh, some toilet paper is a very important thing to have in your in your pack. And a survival kit. You need to have that. First aid kit. I'm going to throw in a snake bite kit just for just in case. Uh, and then in your first, your survival kit, you should have something that can make a signal, something that can make a spark and something that can help with your shelter and kind of like to have multiples of each. So a signal, either a whistle and a mirror and, uh, your flame can also work as a signal, a spark, a lighter, a little thing, of waterproof matches and a magnesium strip. Shelter, that could be your emergency blanket and a bivy sack. And, or like I throw in a old uh, rain fly from a tarp at times when I'm hunting. Extra batteries are in there again. So having that, that uh, um, available for just in case. And I always have the typical first aid kit stuff. Uh, um, some pyro putty for starting a fire. Some kind of... Uh, little things to help with that. So that's my little survival kit. I don't go crazy with it. Uh, cause the more you add, the heavier it gets. So trail food, probably have some bagels as a sandwich. I like the bagels. They handle a little bit better in your pack. They don't get all squished. If you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which is my favorite, put peanut butter on both sides of bread, jelly in the middle, and your bread doesn't get a soggy, a uh, little fruit cups, some bars, nuts and cheese, maybe a mountain house, chocolate trail mix little debbies i'm not much of a jerky guy uh but i like it i just don't make it very often or buy it Uh, peanut butter crackers and then i'm always stuck on bumblebee tuna that stuff's good and nice and easy a good little lunch clothes i'll be wearing it's just some tougher pants i wear some first light gear uh that i like that's lightweight it's gonna make me sweat too much i can move and flex in it well I'll have some different layers. Uh, I wear a blend. All my shirts that I just wear on a daily basis are a 50-50 blend, uh, cotton and polyester. So I'll just wear something like that underneath or my uh, merino wool thin layers of some sort. I'll bring some rain gear. That'll probably stay in the in the four-wheeler, but just in case. Got to wear a hat. I wear a hat on a daily basis anyway. Um, my 
method for getting into stores because in Glenwood Springs here in Colorado, you have to have something. Otherwise, they I don't think they'll let you even in the store to cover your face because of the coronavirus. So uh, I wore a buff into Lowe's the other day. That was the first time I've ever done that. I thought that was interesting. So uh, I'm bringing my buff along, just covering my neck up. And the other thing I'm going to add to my list here right now, because if I forget this, this would be bad. Sunscreen. Need some sunscreen. Because I am red hair, fair skin, and uh, I don't like getting burnt. So uh, maybe some gloves. I like some Milwaukee or uh, mechanics gloves. Those are nice. And then even though it's going to be 90 degrees outside, when I'm hiking, I wear wool socks year-round. A lightweight wool sock is better, but I wear it for the functionality of it. My I don't have foot temperature issues. I don't get too hot. don't get too cold. Uh, so I'll put a liner underneath a wool sock. And the purpose of that is instead of the sock wearing on your foot, you've got a sock wearing on a sock and you're going to have less foot issues. Uh, that's just something I learned way back in the day of Boy Scouts and I've stuck to with me. And uh, every time I'm hiking more than a mile or two, I'm double layered on socks and my feet don't get too sweaty. It'll stink at the end of the day, but it's fine. And then back at camp, uh, I'm going to throw in a second pair of boots, bring my turkey hunting stuff just in case because it's still in my turkey unit. Uh, I'm even going to throw in my metal detector and a gold pan. I don't even know if there's gold in that area, but there could be um, just in case I find some time to do that. And then uh, some recovery wilderness athletes, some ibuprofen, something to get me up the next day after doing 15 mile day. So my plan uh, it's my little one's birthday on April 30th. So I can't leave and I'm not going to, I wouldn't want to leave, uh, not be around for my kid's birthday. So first May 1st is our opening day. I'm going to leave as soon as he goes to bed, I'll leave. And I got about a two and a half hour drive with the camper and go set up camp and be ready for the next day. Uh, our opening, it just says normal hunting hours. So daylight is when I'll be up on the four wheeler and headed out to, to a spot. My expectations for where I'm going, it's kind of a trophy unit area. Um, I got low expectations. Um, buddy of mine scouted out the area and I'm, I'm hoping, obviously hoping that we'll find some big sheds, but it's not always a guarantee. The expectation of shed hunting is, you're going to get skunked. You're going to find a whole pack full. It's just so patchy and uncontrollable. You just don't know. So I'm just hoping to find a few and have a good hike and get away and, and enjoy the outdoors for a few days. So, um, I always like to set goals. I hope I find their hopeful goals are not even really purpose driven goals. It's just a hopeful one. Uh, find some fresh Brown elk and mule deer antlers, and maybe a few sets. That'd be cool. I just, maybe one set would be cool. Uh, some of the other strategies we're going to go with is elevation and understanding maybe some of the wintering areas. Uh, you get a lot of time to think about where the antlers are and where they're not while you're hiking around and wondering why you're not finding anything. Uh, a snow line is maybe something we'll try and stick by for, or what was the snow line when they were shedding, uh, from when we're looking for, for elk antlers. Um, and then I've kind of noticed something. There's some truth, some not truth to this. I mean, antlers can be anywhere. But kind of what I've noticed, and these are my observations, and call me out if I'm wrong, but when I see a bunch of cows or I see a bunch of cow prints, that may not be where I'm going to find a bunch of sheds because uh, it's the cows and the raghorns and the spikes that are hanging out. And I might go find some raghorns and spikes, but when if I want to find a big bull, it's typically bachelor herds of big bulls and some smaller bulls all hang, hanging out. So I may be in the wrong area. I maybe need to get a little higher. So that's kind of an observation I've made with just because you're seeing elk or you're seeing sign of elk, it maybe is not the right sex or size of, of the elk. Uh, you hear a lot of things about what face of the mountain do you spend the more, most time on. Kind of depends on the snowpack, the temperature, the area where you're at and the temperature, what, what it was like, whether when they were dropping, uh, yeah, you can spend some more time on the West facing or North facing slopes. Um, I've seen plenty of hillsides that are 
that are east facing south facing that got lots of cover and it's cool so it just kind of depends but if i had to choose yeah i might shoot for a west or a north and look in those areas some of my strategies i'm going to go with is i'm going to hike and hike and hike and cover some ground kind of trying to to pinpoint some of those areas that look good until i find something because it always seems like when i find one i find another so once I find one, I'll start to kind of grid it out, maybe walk in circles all the way around that one point. You got to mark that in your GPS. You have to. After you find one, mark it because then you'll forget even where you were. Uh, or if it's a big one that you want to find the match with and you do your big grid and you can't find it, you're going to want to maybe come back. So uh, that's kind of been my approach to that, and I'll stick to that this week. Our four-wheeler use is something that's going to be really helpful. There's a lot of roads where we're going, and uh, we're going to use those those four-wheelers maybe in the heat of the day to do a little little trail shed hunting and cover some ground and go look at some stuff because it's going to be hot. And there's also they're going to get us some places that we that we wouldn't be able to get in our trucks. But I, I also am not going in the backcountry to shed hunt, so getting on your four wheeler, cruise down the the roads a little ways, go do a big mile or two mile loop back to the four wheeler, another spot. And then hopefully out covering some ground like that, I'm going to be able to find some, some good sheds. Uh, Onyx is something that I look at every five minutes on my phone. Uh, so that's just a tool. That's a must and strategy. I need to get better at is glassing for shed hunting. I found a few in my day shed hunt, but not uh, with glassing, but not a ton. I just need to get better at it. Cause I know it works. Uh, when you're looking at a hillside, it, it just is all down to the angle. So you can, uh, sit and look and scoot 20 yards to your right. And then you'll find them. Uh, but mark your finds wherever you're at, or if you you're seeing them and you're from a distance, you're head over to them, get some good landmarks. One little thing that I've seen, but it hasn't really proven true for me yet is fence lines hunting those because they're jumping fences. I want to think that I find them there, but I just don't for some reason. Uh, but I've heard that over and over. One thing I have seen a lot in is ditches, any sort of, not like on a, a roadside, but uh, in like old irrigation ditches, old, just a little natural ditch of some sort. That's where I've found actually quite a few. And maybe it's just when they step with that front foot, and it's got a lot of pressure. They jerk their body and their antlers are falling off. I don't know. Uh, but some ditches, bottom drainages seem to be where I find a, a decent amount where I found one of my, my biggest muley sheds. Uh, but don't always, don't always worry about the pressure either as much. Yeah, if you're in one of those areas like Wyoming where the cars are lined up for hours and you're going into a the wildlife refuge or whatever those places are where people are lining up and camping and it's like the uh, Homestead Act when people ransacked to go get their 640 acres or whatever it was. Uh, I'm not in that kind of area. But don't worry about the pressure. Uh, I was hunting a little piece of private this year across from my place and hiking around, looking and looking. And I found a uh, shed from last year. And I know for a fact we did that same hike last year. And this thing was tines up in an open field. Yeah, we had that thing in between both of us last year when it was brown. They get by you all the time. And I, I only wonder what I've walked by. You never know. If you're lucky enough to have a dog that, that shed hunts, good for you. Uh, and if you want to train your dog to shed hunt, here's a couple of things that I've learned. I got a golden retriever. But he's 80 pounds. He's too big. He's too furry, he's long haired. He can't go 10 miles. Uh, and he's not a good shedding hunting dog. I tried it when he was young. I, I put antlers out in my yard, my yard's all sage and kind of drainage and hills. And so we, I've put them all over about five acres worth and taken them out and all have, have treats and he's brought them back to me, but you got to have one of those dogs that's crazy about antlers. My dog's crazy about tennis balls. Whatever it is, you got to get your dog crazy about it. Maybe it's birds of some sort, which a lot of retrieving and hunting dogs are. But get that dog crazy about it so that it can sniff it out. I'll throw a tennis ball and I have to 
get my dog to not look at to where it goes and he'll go sniff that thing out. I guess the tennis balls just have a smell. Uh, even the old rotten ones have been sitting outside forever. Uh, he will find that thing in the sage because it has a smell. Antlers have a smell to it. So get your dog crazy about the smell for that and they'll sniff them out, but they got to have endurance. There's no, my dog was okay with it, but he'd lose interest after a little bit or just he couldn't keep up. And so doing 10 miles of that is, is pretty exhausting. So, uh, there's, there's some good things with that, but for long hikes, I don't know. Uh, you gotta have a stud of a dog. Uh, Cause even, you know, in the school district, you get, bring in the drug dogs every once in a while. The drug dogs, even those dogs get tired. They're only good for so long before their, their nose get worn out or, and they're, and they're not doing their job as, as well. If you got horses, good for you. Also that gets you few feet up off the ground and able to cover some serious ground. So lucky you, if you got horses, uh, that'd be a cool thing to to have, but I got a four wheeler that just uses a couple of gallons of gas. And that's, that's my, my pony, uh, got a couple of shed hunting stories for you. So it's in a, on a piece of public and had a, uh, nice, nice day. Picked up a full pack of, of elk antlers, hiking around it. It just was one of those days I'd pick up the binos, look around. Oh, there's one. Walk over, get it. Pick up the binos, look around. Oh, there's another one. There's another one. There's another one. It just was over and over again. Just one of those dream days of picking up, up antlers. And later found out that that was the exact place where a 415-inch bull came out of. Because uh, that, that bull's sheds were at the... Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation Banquet, and you had to guess the score. I don't know if I was there before. I don't know if I was there after. I don't know. But that bull was there in that same area. I found that out from from some folks uh, that that spent some time in that property. Uh, But, man, I was close. 415-inch bull. Uh, Just a beautiful, beautiful bull. And I was so close. So you never know what you're going to walk by. Uh, and I think I walked by a shed of a lifetime or a set of a lifetime because there, that person found both of them. And then I posted a picture on my Instagram of maybe a week ago about my nicest muley to date, uh, took those sheds and put them on one of those little, uh, plastic Euro mount things and put it up on the wall. Found that one, like I was saying earlier at the bottom of a ditch, uh, just in some dry, dry pinion juniper. It was a North facing slope. And never found another shed. That was the only shed I found. And it was in the high 70s is what that we're guessing that bull measured or that buck measured. Uh, and it's got some little kickers and there. It's got some extra points. It's just really, really nice muley. And determined to find the other side. And it took me another time to come back with my wife. And we scoured and scoured and scoured. And I didn't mark it with my GPS so I was in the area, but I couldn't find that exact spot. It took me a little while uh, and eventually found the other side, which was much smaller, which was a bummer because otherwise that thing would have been, I think, a, a high 180s, uh, but really, really nice muley. And then another one of my favorite sheds that I found was actually deer hunting. Uh, had it picked up a leftover tag in a unit where there is tons of people and you had you were just you saw way more hunters than you saw anything else it just was insane never seen a place with so many hunters and was invited to go on a little piece of property that was private but i couldn't hunt the private i could just go through the private to uh, an area and to get to the back side of this public where all these people were and ended up shooting a really beautiful 160s muley uh, that, uh, you measure like what right at 160, but I mounted him because he's a beautiful buck His I'm looking at him right now. He's got his brow tines that are super bladed. Uh, he's got a little three inch kicker on one side. He's super chocolatey, just a beautiful, really cool deer. And it's just had a fun hunt with it. So I made sure I mounted that one, but one night we got to this cabin on the private and didn't grab my pack, nothing. It was like, oh, we got about 10 minutes of daylight left. I'm going to hike up on this hill. Kind of took a look at, at 
a hillside there, dry as a bone. There's nothing there. It's like, oh, geez, there's a deer there. Uh, that's cool. I think one of those is a buck. Uh, maybe take a better look at it. Oh, look, there's a shed uh, and a big white chalky elk antler. And I was looking, okay, where's that at? I got to make sure I get back to that. Uh, and then it's like, well, I should take a look at that, that deer a little bit better and realize, oh, I think that's a good deer. I'll shoot him. So it was actually 450 yards away, turned my turrets and made a good shot and, uh, went over there and got my buck. And then I went and got the shed and realized it was a massive, massive elk shed. And that's my largest elk shed to date. It was probably 50 yards from that deer that I shot, but it's all chalky and missing a bunch of stuff. So it could have been a seven point, uh, bull of some sort, but just massive, but I brought it back cause it was cool. Uh, and, and that came out with the, with the deer. So just a fun, fun, uh, shed that, that I remember getting. And I got a few of those that I just stick up on the, on my shelves and, and remember them and remember the story or I remember who I was with. And that's kind of the reason I really like shed hunting. So that'll be hopefully this weekend. I got something for hopefully something Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, that's that's noteworthy noteworthy to share and a good story because uh, hopefully we'll have a good time. And uh, hopefully you get out and do a little shed hunting as well, or if you're you're busy turkey hunting, great. That's a, another great way to spend the spring. But until next time, thanks for listening, and we'll chat with you then. See ya.